I would like to Rob, uh, in, um, introduce um, Robert from the Florida College System Risk Management Consortium, who we've asked, the trustees asked today to um, meet and talk with us for about 15 minutes about um, our concerns about um, our health care costs and so forth. So, Robert, thank you so much for coming on behalf of the consortium. Thank you. We uh, thank really you. appreciate the opportunity to uh, be with you this afternoon, and, and we've put together a a brief packet of information uh, that hopefully will be helpful on the subject and then certainly welcome any questions. Uh, following the, um, uh, on the inside of your folder there on the left side uh, is what I'll be speaking from that packet of information. And following the cover, there are just six pages of, uh, of overview information that we thought would be uh, most helpful uh, and perhaps stimulate some questions. And then that portion of the additional portion of the packet there are exhibits. If you would like more detail on any of the topics, we're prepared to uh, go into that detail. So looking at uh, page uh, two and three, uh, we provide an or overview of the consortium. Um, in 1980, the Florida legislature uh, provided the colleges within the Florida college system uh, to form the Florida College System Risk Management Consortium a uh, cooperative effort of um, risk management and uh, risk pools. And initially, um, the, uh, the program uh, included property and casualty risk pool, and today 27 of the 28 colleges participate in that. And then subsequent to that, uh, the employee benefits emerged as an additional uh, option and, and risk pool, and today we have 23 of the uh, colleges participating in that program. At the Florida College uh, System Risk Management Consortium, the employees are actually uh, employees of the Florida College System. And we, uh, our fis we're located, our headquarters in, is in Gainesville, and the fiscal agent is Santa Fe College for our, our uh, employees. And on page three is just a, a little additional uh, detail. Um, each of the college board of trustees uh, has an agreement uh, with the consortium. They're identical agreements, but they're uh, signed by each board of trustee. And most recently, as you will see there on page three, 2014-2015, uh, each college board attorney, uh, the council of presidents, uh, legal counsel, and the consortium attorney uh, work to review and update those agreements. And today there, um, there is a, that joint agreement uh, creates, again, the Florida College uh, system of uh, Risk Management Consortium. Our immediate body of authority at the consortium is the Operations Committee. The Operations Committee is made up of uh, two college presidents that are selected from the Council of Presidents. They chair the meeting. And then there's seven business officers and two human resource officers. And those individuals are selected from the Council of Business Affairs. And that Operations Committee, and those are rotation positions on there. The uh, the committee uh, reviews and approves the, uh, the work from the consortium, and then those approvals are ratified by the Council of Presidents. On page uh, four, uh, we begin to provide a, um, just a high-level overview of the self-insured health program that's offered by the consortium. And there's two key indicators on this particular page, um, and, and the indicators are supported by the collective purchasing power of the 23 colleges and over 19,000 members that make up the self-insured health program. That collective purchasing power uh, per, uh, forms a, a tremendous strength as we go to the marketplace and seeking uh, the highest value, uh, lowest cost uh, services and products for the program. And the two key indicators, if you look at the premiums, the average annual premium change of the overall consortium program versus the marketplace, uh, it's 5.66% versus 9.2%, 9.72%. And then the other key indicator is the benchmark study. Uh, the study is um, actuarially credible and certified by a national actuarial consulting firm, Milliman USA. There's over 54 uh, million uh, members uh, that claims are examined. And when you compare the benefits uh, in the college consortium self-insured plan with the national, uh, regional, and industry specific, which is education, uh, the comparisons all favor the consortium benefits as being uh, higher 
than those offered in those comparisons. So it's, a, um, it's two key success indicators of uh, the lower cost and the higher benefits that uh, can often be uh, difficult to achieve. On the next page, page five, there are two important components to the way the self-insured plan is rated. The first is an annual underwriting evaluation that looks at the overall pool of experience from the 23 colleges and the 19,000 members. Uh, that examines the, uh, the most recent claim experience and it, uh, a projection is developed for the upcoming calendar year on what those claims are expected to be. And then that is combined with the expected uh, expenses and other debits and credits associated with the program. And an adjustment is made to all 23 college rates on an annual basis is the same percentage that is made to all college rates. And the plan by design is for 93% of the premiums uh, to go toward paying claims, 3% uh, of the premium toward administration, and that includes the Florida Blue or plan administrator, claim processing, access to their uh, network providers, which by the way, their negotiated discounts at Florida Blue are reducing our claim costs for all colleges over 50% uh, from those expenses that are actually incurred. And then 4% of the money goes towards stop loss insurance, which literally insures those high cost claims. The next page, page six, is the other key component that um, it probably is most of interest today, and that's the rate validation. Um, the other key thing to do in, in the rating methodology, because the 28 colleges can opt in or out of the health program, so it's important to do a periodic actuarial evaluation of the individual college rates. When a college first joins the consortium, their rates are developed based on their own claim experience, their demographics, and the regional medical cost in their area. And then from that point on, they get the annual uniform adjustment, and then the plan that has been approved by the Operations Committee and the Council of Presidents is to every three years do a rate validation assessment. And the reason that's important is to ensure that the individual college rates are actuarially correct, because if not, uh, you get in a situation where the good experience colleges could leave the consortium for better local rates and the poor experienced colleges would not leave and you eventually begin to get in a, a very unfavorable underwriting situation. So um, the rate validation again is important and what we did in this year's rate validation was to look at all the college's most uh, recent three year period uh, experience and demographics and claims, high cost claims and from those, then we determined uh, whether any colleges were in the outlier, where their rates were noticeably either overstated or understated, and that's how we addressed that. The timeline associated with our underwriting work um, has been the same for over 30 years. We have an underwriting evaluation and process that occurs during the summer months, and those recommendations coming out of that process for the upcoming calendar year are taken to the operations committee at their August meeting for review and approval. And then assuming that approval is achieved there, then that uh, recommendation is taken to the Council of Presidents for ratification. And then finally, to look specifically at Florida Gateway College rate validation analysis that occurred in 2017 and impacted your January 1st, 2018 uh, rate change. In looking at the, um, the period of time that was observed, the Florida Gateway College, the loss ratio was 104% versus the average loss ratio for the consortium of 90.9%. If we uh, eliminated the high cost claims at Florida Gateway College, then your loss ratio dropped to 101.8%. The third bullet, you can see that unfortunately, the premiums from Florida Gateway College did not cover your claims during that particular time period that was observed. So that meant that the other colleges in this case were somewhat subsidizing the Florida Gateway College program and that the Florida Gateway College premiums unfortunately uh, did not make any um, 
uh, support or contribution toward the Florida Blue Administrative, the network access costs, the uh, stop loss insurance, the uh, enrollment, uh, automated enrollment and compliance administration from FBMC, the actuarial audit and consulting services, and then of course the consortium administrative expenses. There's other things that, uh, that the consortium also has done for Florida Gateway College. The federal government required uh, your college to pay um, health care reform fees during the last few years, and the consortium uh, reimbursed those fees to all colleges. In your particular case, uh, those fees amounted to $34,917. And then the last, um, the last bullet um, just uh, gives an indication from an outside independent actuary as to uh, the cost that your program may have uh, experienced outside the consortium. And that's primarily driven from the administration and stop loss expenses. Uh, a group your size would typically, rather than pay the 4% stop loss and 3% administrative expenses, a group this size would typically be in the 15 to 25% range um, leaving um, much less of your money to go toward the, uh, the, cl the claim payments. So that's an overview. Um, um, I appreciate your, your patience. I certainly welcome uh, any questions or discussion that would be helpful to you. Is it that small colleges tend to run into this problem more than the larger colleges? In other words, we got 100 employees and the next college has got 1,000. Obviously, they're taking in more money and premiums, but then the, they've got more people out there to make claims. But on average, it, are the small colleges the ones that are upside down? I guess yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. I mean, typically, uh, as, as you know, as a group becomes larger, uh, their claims do become more predictable. So if you think back about the way we originally rated groups when they came into the consortium, we looked at their experience, demographics, regional medical costs. So if I had 1,000 employees, um, uh, the, my, the rates that were originally set were probably slightly more accurate than, than these smaller colleges, which would have a tendency to be uh, less predictable. So um, that, but, but when you look at this year's rate validation, uh, you did have some in, in both uh, outliers uh, where the rates were either overstated or understated. So the question for you, because, you know, it's a three-year look back on um, claims and, and whatnot, and so it's, all, it's a question for you all as well as a question for the college, but, you know, a lot of organizations knowing that they're um, part of a larger consortium and, and ways to try to help their employee base have more um, a healthy lifestyle choices, things that might positively impact, um, you know, as we move to the next three years, are there things that we should be doing as a college, encouraging our staff that could have better claim experience for us? That's a great question. And and we've one got a couple doctors on, on the board here too, so I'm sure they're interested to know. Um, we've got a very stable employee population, as you've seen in terms of um, longevity um, and so that's great for us um, but um, there might be some things that we need to endorse as a board or as a <coughs> administration in terms of some choice healthy lifestyle choices that might have a positive impact yeah that's a great question uh, one of the things we're doing is working with our plan administrator um, and individually working with the colleges on wellness um, and we have a number of uh, wellness initiatives and uh, um, uh, contribution towards uh, wellness uh, programs that, that hopefully will be helpful. So we want to work with the individual colleges and in implementing those uh, where we can and, and where, they, where they make a good fit. Um, we also have uh, introduced, um, beginning this year, a, uh, an additional um, benefit, Teladoc, uh, which is an additional initiative that will help uh, members to um, secure medical care and, and even prescription drug renewals. Um, so we're working also to, and, and we'll begin sharing with the colleges even more information than we have in the past in terms of their specific cost and utilization information, not, not patient specific, but in general. Uh, maybe emergency room use is, is higher than normal, and, and we can do some things to, to address that. So 
Uh, we are doing things uh, uh, both in reporting and then, then the other thing in terms of the rate validation, knowing that that's going to occur every three years, we want to closely monitor that and plan on monitoring that to where we can work with you to see if the rate adjustment made January 1 is in fact that coupled with the, um, the wellness initiatives and things like that, if in fact they are having the, the expected and, and hopeful impact to where uh, you do not face the same situation again in three years. Robert, if I could interject, Justin Piazza of the Consortium. Um, to answer that question a little more as well, um, some of the wellness initiatives that we do have um, for all the colleges are um, personal health assessments that we, we definitely encourage our uh, member colleges to participate in. Florida Blue comes in, they'll do biometric screen screenings. Um, this year what we are doing is um, every member that comes to a uh, get their PHA, their personal health assessment, we will be giving them a uh, $15 gift card. Um, if the college gets above 50% of, so anybody that comes to, comes to that will automatically get a $15 gift card. If the college gets 50% or more of their employee population, say the employee population is 208 of eligible um, participants in the program, they get 50% or higher, they're going to get another $10 um, gift card. Again, it, it, that's so that the employees can know their numbers. And I think uh, behavioral change is, is key for that. So that's one of the things we're doing. Uh, another incentive that we are, are, are going for the colleges is if the college puts together a wellness business plan, the consortium is going to fund um, those initiatives up to $5,000. So if a college, Florida Gateway College, comes and says, this is our wellness business plan. We want to, um, Florida Southwestern, for instance, they have pieces of equipment throughout their, their campuses that uh, they look like park benches, but on the side there's a little plaque that says you can do step ups or you can do this exercise or that exercise. Um, if a college says we want, we want to do that, we're going to help fund that up to, to $5,000 to get your employees active and get your employees also engaged in wellness. Florida Blue also has a website um, that we're introducing this year, Well Talk, that when the employee goes in and does their personal health assessment, say they have um, high blood pressure. They're going to get a personalized WellTalk card. It's, it's all online. It's all integrated. They can download an app on their phone and it's going to give them specific things that they can do wellness-wise to help with that high blood pressure. Another thing that I'm really excited about is a diabetes prevention program that we are rolling out to all the colleges. Um, it is a program that was created by the CDC in partnership um, with a grant with Florida Blue and uh, I'm excited about this because uh, one, one out of three um, have diabetes or pre-diabetic um, in, in our society, and we've seen those numbers with uh, our, our member colleges as well. And what we want to do is, 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 again, behavior change. So in the diabetes prevention program, there are, you have to qualify for the program, but it's easy to qualify. Um, you have to have a certain A1C number, you have to have a certain, um, uh, and I, I can send all this information if I haven't already sent it to you, Sharon. Yeah, we already um, participate yeah. in a lot of this. Yeah, so, so, so you, we, have, we have that information, and once the, that, um, that member qualifies for this program, uh, you're going to get a personal health coach for the first six months. Once a, once, a, um, once a week, you're gonna, they're going to meet with their personal health coach. It could be online, or you can go to a local YMCA that participates in this program. That participant's going to get a Bluetooth scale um, that, because uh, you know, we can, we can lie about our numbers, but that, that participant can get a Bluetooth scale where the coach is actually getting real-time numbers um, for, for the participant. Uh, after a certain amount of time, they're going to get a $50 voucher for a Fitbit. Um, now, if they want, that's going to be the basic line Fitbit, but if they want to go get a higher Fitbit, um, they can pay, pay whatever the uh, extra expense is for that. Um, so uh, the next six months, it's going to go from once a week to, to once a month um, coaching. But we're excited about that program. So there are some things that uh, we encourage our colleges to, to participate in. We encourage uh, Florida Gateway, if they don't already have one, to, to form a wellness committee to, to talk about these things and, uh, and, and to, to push them forward to the employees. Hope I answered so I guess I'd ask Sharon, I think I heard Sharon say that we already are doing. Yeah, we have, we have a wellness committee. We, for the past four years, I think three, first year we had 50% or better of our employees that participated in the um, personal health assessment that you were talking about, mm -hmm. Justin. And um, total amount of money over the four years, anyway, the last three years we had 60% 
first year was 50. And the next two were 50%. I mean, 60% of our employees participated in the personal health assessment plan like he's talking about. And then last year, I think it was 50%. But um, we do have a wellness plan put together, as, you're, as he spoke of. And we do have several employees that receive um, just I'm sorry, I'm sorry behind you. They receive money for, um, they check in each time they do certain amount of uh, wellness activities. Uh, I think that's what you were talking about. They get a certain amount of money. Some of them have gotten $100, $150. Yeah, we, we've changed that this year, um, excuse me, as far as the, the, the incentives for employees. They, in the past, they could get gift, gift cards after they did so many things. Um, we, we found that, and I, just to be all honest with you, we, we were spending over $500,000 on wellness um, system-wide, and we had to figure out with the $30 million um, cut with the system and some other things that are going on, um, how can we better be better fiscal s stewards of, of that money? Um, and so uh, by direction of our operations committee, um, we have changed the wellness program a little bit. Um, instead of incenting um, all those, those things, because the, the question we can continue to ask, are we just paying the runners to run? Um, and one of the, that's one of the things that we wanted to, to make sure that we weren't just paying runners to run, but we wanted to actually drive lifestyle change. And so uh, re redesigning our program this year, so there's not going to be the, um, the, the employee actually going in and doing certain things to get a $50 gift card. Uh, they'll get the gift card if they come to the, the personal health assessment, but we're going to drive some other change by the di diabetes prevention program. And, so and will we still be getting the... Um Ten thousand or fifteen thousand by meeting them. No, uh, so I didn't think so. Yeah, That's so going away. yeah, as long as but as long as you have the the wellness business plan, we will fund um, or underwrite up to five thousand dollars. What what you want to do for wellness? Let somebody refresh my memory. We have missed this November. What is our rating? Thirteen point uh, three percent. Thirteen point four five percent. Four five percent. And what does that equate to in dollars? Two hundred and nineteen thousand dollars for um, individual coverage, and an additional uh, twelve uh, hundred and twenty dollars a month for dependent coverage for our employees. Correct? Approximately. And and then this this three year loss ratio of one hundred four percent. Where do we rank among those twenty three colleges? Are we the worst? Um, no, no. Uh, we had um, six colleges that the rates were overstated. They got decreases. We had nine colleges that just got the pool change, 4.88%. And then there were eight colleges that required some additional uh, charge. Three of those, 0.53%, um, 0.57%, 1.4%, so they're less than 1.5%. Uh, you were the fourth on that list, so there were... Um, there were uh, four colleges that had rates, uh, rate increases higher than yours. And um, it's public record, so can you share with us which ones those were? Absolutely. Um, we go dig the it up colleges the were, were Tallahassee, were I know. Tallahassee. Tallahassee. Eastern Florida. Okay. Yeah, Lake Sumter and Pasco Hernando State College, Eastern Florida State College, Tallahassee Community College. So outside of Tallahassee, probably some smaller schools and Tallahassee, um, they have a very unique situation there, uh, you know, where the state is, of course, and uh, they have a fully insured HMO that has the majority of their enrollment. And then we have our self-insured right. PPO that has uh, less than 200 uh, employees, about 100. Okay, so it puts it in the employees. small, in the small group. So um, there, um, yeah, we're like taking a dollar, paying out a dollar fifty. <laughs> so. so uh, Chipola uh, was there were actually small. six that had a decrease, not necessarily Actually, significant. Um, Chipola had a significant decrease. Yeah, Chipola had the largest. Uh, they ranged from 1.24% uh, to 17.9%. What was that decrease? Excuse me? How many hundreds of thousands? 219,000 for Chipola they received back or something approximately that much, if I recall. So Correct. a couple of questions I've got. Uh, we'll start with budget planning. So, you know, my, my job is just to act as a steward for the college and, and no capacity am I going to make any accusations. As a healthcare professional, I can tell you, list, you know, insurance is a very tricky thing to deal with. 
uh, and you're never going to make everybody happy no matter what. I understand that concept. Um, first, I think the thing that caught us as a board, and I hope it's okay to speak for all of us, uh, if I'm wrong, correct me, is if a validation is going to occur every three years, no matter what, rain or sunshine, doesn't matter, you know, as a budget, we have, you know, numbers that we're given and we have to work within the budget. And when we go to the governor and we go to the state and we say, hey, here's what we need, here's what we're going to, it may not seem like a, you know, catastrophic amount of money, but $200,000, $219,000 is a lot of money. So how do we prevent in the future getting kind of blindsided for better or for worse? Um, if we know it's going to happen in three years, to me, the timing was an issue. And, and I've got a few other points I want to go over, but that's one thing that I, I think we can prepare, then we can know, hey, we're looking good. You know, how do we, is there a 12 month, a 24 month, a 36 month right before, you know, the other shoe drops sort of evaluation so that we can make sure it's really hard to institute change after the fact, before, and then we prepare, budgets look good, and everybody's happy in Tallahassee, we're happy, and then things work out better. I, I think to me that was probably the most difficult part was the timing. Um, especially right when we had already discussed ad nauseum, you know, some budget things that we were trying to make benefits here and doing things for, because, you know, either way, the benefits we provide to our employees are part of retention, right? So if, if they have good benefits, they're happy, they're more likely to stay, so we want to keep them happy. Um, how do we prevent that from happening? That's an excellent question, and um, some with you having some familiarity with health insurance, you know, it's difficult to... Uh, predict those claims uh, when you get too far out. In fact, a, a group your size typically, and we have Florida Blue here to, uh, as well as a couple consultants, but I think what they would tell you is typically a group your size, if you were on your own, either fully insured or self-insured, you would get your renewal in October for January 1st. Uh, that's the way insurance companies, that's typically when they roll them out. Because of the, the, the collective power, uh, you know, we can out, act a little bit more like a larger group. So we do the underwriting in the summer months uh, and traditionally have taken that to the committee in August. We're, we're looking at two things to try to help with that problem and, and, and certainly uh, full respect for the issue. Um, we're working with the operations committee to uh, secure uh, actuarial opinions on what if we look at the uh, May meeting and, uh, and at that point, we do at least a, a hardcore preliminary indication with the finalization in August. You would expect not a lot of change, not a lot of difference. So right. that would help some. Can you do a, a final in May? Uh, problem with backing that up is, again, you have very little observation of what benefit enrollment changes just occurred at the first of the year and just the medical delivery system dynamics is a lot of changes. So it's hard to back it up that far. But the other thing we're going to try to do, uh, uh, we are going to do, is to um, have actuarial assistance in doing kind of a rolling three to where in the spring we can look at it and, and see whether that, how that experience is running at that point. That should help some. We're also Great. going to do quarterly uh, cost and utilization uh, reports uh, specific to each college that will also help. So. Hopefully those, those will assist That would be them. greatly appreciated um, because I think that as a board member was the part was like, what? We just finished our budget. We had all this. Had we known? Um, when, when did we uh, find out roughly? Was it August 22nd we were notified and then the ratification of the College of Presidents didn't occur until October. Of, gotcha. Um, that. Okay. So that sounds great. Kind of touching base before summer really isn't. And I know, you know, we can't hold you 100% accountable to say this is going to be for sure what it is, but at least we have an idea. It should okay, help eventually. Hey, we're going to need to access funds or we're going to have to move from one fund pool to another. Um, next thing, uh, and I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just trying to understand because I, I read through the emails, and thank you for keeping us informed. The market is stable, question mark here. Uh, who said that? Where did, what, what email was that in that I read that somebody was citing that the reason why is that now that there's some level of market stability? Because if that person is here, I would love to get their input. No, the issue was, the, the issue was why did it take place, the three-year um, take place, when it hasn't taken place since fall of 2000, uh, since 2009. So there's been an eight-year gap in doing this three-year. And I was told in the public in the COP meeting 
and in private meetings that because of the Affordable Care Act is now stabilized, that's why we chose to do the three-year study. Who told you that? Because that uh, actually uh, Chauncey Fagler <laughs> at the, at yeah, the Let me just help with that just I mean, a little bit. Um, well, I think the Affordable Care Act just got destabilized by Congress. I mean, <laughs> that's a, that, <laughs> that isn't I, a public I'm not record. saying to be mean. I'm not saying to be mean, but I, 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 everybody in this room looks very brilliant. In case you're wondering, you guys all look like you know your stuff. But I'm thinking to myself, you guys know something I don't know. I want to know who 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 has this information. Well, what what happened? The last time we did the rate validation was actually 2010. And um, at the same time, uh, health care reform began to right. roll out. What happened in health care reform, there were a significant number um, of uh, benefit change mandates, uh, took away annual maximums, you know, inside maximums, uh, you know, increased the, uh, the age of children to 26. So there were, those are just some. <laughs> there was a lot of uh, interference with the risk that made it very difficult to get your arms around it. And then that coupled with, we introduced a number of benefit plans because of the increase in health care costs associated with those mandates. Some colleges really just could not afford that additional expense. So we introduced new plans. So we had colleges changing benefits, enrollment shifting around, mandates. So in working with our actuarial consultants, we concluded that the risk for, for the pool, we could still do the annual adjustments, even though there was still a lot of unknown. But to try to break it down then to individual colleges with 300 employees, 400, their shifted benefits, it became, we concluded that it became very difficult to try to do rate, rate validation within that mix. So now that that has, now that we have better knowledge of the risk associated with many of those mandates, um, then, now we feel that we can go back and begin looking at that individual college experience and have some some reliability with it. So I think it, somebody who deals with you know providers in Florida, Blue is a wonderful provider um, as far as you know the quality of care they're giving to our constituents that we represent. Um, I know that specifically in this particular marketplace, there's a great amount of instability. So that's where to what he said, or when I read that email, and I was like, what, are you kidding me? Um, for example, AVMED pulled out of this county recently, right? I'm sure you guys know that because you're from Florida Blue. So I'm thinking, if somebody's saying it's stable and we've got other providers citing instability as the reason why they're leaving, you can see how that kind of makes me go, what? So, sure, absolutely. So I, I kind of, I beg to differ based on what other providers are saying. You know, if, if I've got a provider saying, hey, we're pulling out of the area because it's too unstable, we have no freaking idea what's going to go on. I, you know, to me, that was concerning. Um, the next thing I had was when Chuck was talking about the sample population, I think that you're right, the variance, you know, of only having 200 people versus 300 people, that's hard to predict. The other thing that we have, which is a double-edged sword, which, you know, if you guys can help us with is, you can see tonight we had great retention with employees. Mm -hmm. um, that's a double-edged sword, right? So we really like the educators that stick around and do a wonderful job and perform and get us, you know, our end product, which is students who go get real jobs, who help contribute to our state. Um, that's a pro, right? Well, the con is, when you look at it, I didn't see a breakdown by age. I really kind of want to see that, not to be discriminatory or an ageist, but to say, hey, this college has an aging population, because I think that may be a predetermining factor as well, <clears throat> to say, Florida Gateway's average age is blank, and here's per claim based on age, because we know somebody who's 65 who needs a knee replacement is probably going to cost more than a college that has rapid turnover where somebody only stays for 10 years and the chances of a 40 year old needing a knee replacement are probably a little bit different and so you know I can see why some of the colleges maybe get a benefit and some colleges don't and that doesn't reflect poorly on them that's just hey we, we do a great job I think of retention um, so breakdown by age is something I kind of want to see to try to determine, now that doesn't mean we're gonna go through and say, oh, sorry, you're too old, you gotta retire. Nobody's gonna do that. We're not gonna discriminate in that capacity. But I think to help predict, we need maybe a little bit more information as well. Sure. Um, because if somebody has a myocardial infarction and has a cabbage times three, you know, that's a quarter million dollar hospitalization, if not a lot more, versus somebody who just, you know, breaks an arm. Yeah. And that's well, something that we could definitely get to complete. Um, in my August 22nd meeting, I did provide um, some placemats that, uh, 
um, that Florida Blue put together that ha does have some of those analytics, so well, some of the drug spins. I love things. seeing that because I feel like for me and my patient population, when Florida does, Florida Blue says, hey, this person's on this high risk thing based on their age, or you've got X amount of people that need to be screened for whatever, so we can kind of be more interactive and proactively go after patients who maybe need to be doing the health screening instead of saying, you know, we're, we're just haphazardly doing this thing on this one day, say, hey, you know, we haven't touched base with you. Is there any way we could get you involved? And that way we can get those lifestyle ins changes instituted early rather than letting our employees have bad stuff happen to them. Who's the best person to send an electronic version of that? Sharon? Sharon? Yeah. Sharon, I think we have that already, but I, I mean, we could share that with you. Yeah, the, the cost utilization report goes into quite a bit of detail of <laughs> gotcha. age and, and the actives and retirees, uh, gotcha. as you all know, and, in Florida, um, the mandate is that uh, actives must be offered the, the same plan at the rate no higher than the actives. And Only other thing I want to see, and I'm sorry for interrupting you, but I know I'm taking too long, so I apologize. Appreciate your no, patience with me. This is important stuff to our employees and to our students because it's money out of the student coffers of tuition right. and, and whatnot. So. Three years prior to this past three year span, I want to know how we did. And three years prior to that, I want to know how we did because. I think that's interesting to see because we never got any like benefit or ding one way or the other. Like, did we make out like a bandit those three years prior, mm -hmm. or did we, you know, hey, we paid over? Because I think when you have all the colleges get together, whoever it is that's not having to pay is going to be like, this is great, this is awesome, and whoever it is that gets the short stick, you know, is going to be like, wait. So I, I, you know, I don't want you to think I'm mad in that capacity. I think that it's um, important to know hey, this is how we did the three years prior. What were we doing better then that maybe we needed to be doing now? What were we doing the three years prior? And that way we can kind of see, had this happened three years ago, ago what would have happened? Had it happened three years prior to that? Not, not beyond that, because I think beyond that, like you said, you know, market changes at that time, it's, it's really volatile. Yeah, we did go back, actually. The last rate validation, as I mentioned, was 2010, and at that point, Florida Gateway College had 102% loss ratio, and we looked at that period uh, covering those years between the two, and unfortunately, yeah, that loss ratio remained, uh, remained pretty high. So I would have wanted to know what happened in, what, if we had done this in 2013, what would have happened? If we had done this in 2016, what would have happened? And that way, because I, I believe in trends. I mm -hmm. firmly do, and mm -hmm. I feel like sure. if in three more years it's going to happen again, man, we really need to do something to keep our people healthier. Um, so, you know, I appreciate the programs that Justin has thrown out there, and I appreciate, you know, your patience with getting us these things. But I feel like data in this situation is is crucial to understand. <laughs> staff doctor, where we are and sure, I think so. those are excellent points, and we'll <laughs> certainly work with your college well, and provide. Thank them. you so much. I Absolutely. apologize. I was making notes as you were going along, and I thought, let me ask now because you know, email back and forth and all of this stuff, but. I really appreciate your, your patience with us. We appreciate the chance to be no, here. Those um, are great questions, great observations. Yeah, and I do think we have a few more questions. And I'm, I would, am willing to take as much time as we all agree, is, because this is a huge increase for us. And, but this is also an educational opportunity for us, because um, you know, it's money that we didn't necessarily budget. We're going to have to figure out what, what to do. Um, it's a shared responsibility, the way I look at it, between the employer and the employees, because um, they need to be um, knowledgeable of what we can and cannot offer in good conscience as an employer because again there's a there's a tipping point too when it comes out of the ability to serve students so part of all the questions and whatnot is also to help our our staff and our constituents understand uh, it's easy to throw out like a percentage but you know what's the actual dollar amount because uh, you know a percentage is could be inflated by it being such a small number whatnot I did have um, a, a question regarding, and this is more maybe even directed towards Sharon too as well, because I know that my employer um, every year comes back and they do adjust the offerings that I get. And sometimes it's like, geez, you know, last year's plan was a little bit better and this one's not, they're asking a little more out of me this year. But I mean, I understand from our group, um, we're with the large group as well, but you know they're going to have experience that they're going to apply to that, and it means that some plans are just really not in the scheme of the um, financial plan for the organization to continue to be viable. And so they eliminate things and they tweak it and whatnot. So as we look at our health options on page nine, and that we're part of, are we? Um, where would you grade out our plans in terms of? Um, current marketplace. Um, I know a few years back, we were you know, doing things that were just like the marketplace wasn't even doing anymore, and and we just had to go, hey, wait a minute, we got to at least ask some 
shared responsibility, shared accountability. So grade us out on where we are in terms of what you're seeing on the plans that we're offering versus what you see from other colleges that might have, you know, better experience, less premiums. What are they asking their employees to help, you know, carry the burden of the I mean, increase of health care? We all know that we're getting in increases in our health care costs if you're, you know, part of a, a plan. So just in the spirit of honesty, tell us where we are in our plans. Are they too generous? Do we need to revisit the competitiveness of the plans? Are we asking too much of our employees? Justin? Sure. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a very good question. We, and I was just at the Seminole um, State College Board talking about this, this very thing. Um, we have plans from Platinum. If you go out onto the marketplace and you are on your own, and um, they have them um, Platinum, um, Gold, um, all the way down to Bronze. Uh, so we have Platinum plans all the way to to a, a Bronze plan, a very um, broad um, spectrum that any college can can choose from. So how how it works is we will bring um, the the benefit plan offerings to to the colleges, and the colleges pick. Um, what, what they would like to like to uh, choose for their employees, what be best fits their employees. So even though you're part of the consortium, each college picks the plan that they think is the correct. best for their employees. That, and that's correct. On the menu. Yeah, okay. and so um, some of the most of the colleges pay a hundred percent of the employee only rate, okay. but then a hundred percent of the dependent rate is on the employee. Um, so that you 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 you, you start to see the big disparity there, where 100% um, of uh, for an employee only is fine, but all of a sudden the, 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 there's no help on the dependent side. So some colleges, I think there's um, three or four, maybe 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 five colleges that have um, broken the norm. Instead of paying 100% of the employee, they're paying. Uh, say 80% of the employees so that they can help on the dependent side as well. Some colleges are putting in a wellness aspect to it. So we introduced an HSA this year. Right. Um, so the HSA is a high deductible, for those that don't know, is a high deductible uh, consumer driven health plan. It's $1,500 um, deductible, um, but, the, the, but the rate is about 50% less than the employee only rate um, uh, that you currently have. So uh, you take that 50% less, so you're still, it's still partnered with a 80-20 PPO plan. Um, the consortium is going to fund $500 for an employee only, $1,000 for employee plus one, and $1,500 for employee plus family. Um, the out-of-pocket maximum is only 4500 compared to, say, the um, 3562, or I can't remember exactly which one you have. You have the 3559, so that's a $600 deductible, but the out-of-pocket maximum um, is $6,000 um, for that. So the HSA is only 4500 out-of-pocket maximum. Plus and so get, some of the colleges... 1500 bucks. Yeah, so some of the colleges are actually going... To, to that HSA because A, it's a cheaper premium, B, it educates your employee to have, and I, I hate using this term, these terms loosely, but having skin in the game. Right now, if you go to the ER and your deductible is only $50, um, they'll go to the ER because it's easier to go there, or they're going to the urgent care because it's only a $40 a copay instead of understanding, okay, it only cost me $40, but it's costing the plan fifteen hundred dollars per time every time time that you go so some of the colleges are understanding that and um, moving their population more um, to those those things that you're kind of caught in a catch-22 because because of the the, the funding system of, of the college system raises aren't um, the way they we want them to be and um, one of the things that you've been able to offer is, look, we've got good benefits. Right. We've got yeah. rich benefits, and that, that is a recruiting tool. And so you're caught in that dilemma of wanting that to, to offer these rich benefits, but at the same time, uh, medical costs continue to skyrocket. Um, trends continue to skyrocket, but salaries don't. And so keeping up with that is, is tough. So you, to answer your question, there, there are many plans that you can choose from, from a platinum to a bronze. It's just really figuring out what's going to best suit your, your, your population. And, and we want to do, do whatever we can to help facilitate that. Um, for and I think what, so I think what you heard you say is that we're, we're pretty much middle of the road in line with all, most of the other colleges right now in terms of competitive landscape and what we're offering for our employees. Sure. Okay. Yeah. 
Anybody else have any other questions? I just had a point of qual clarification because I'm, um, and that isn't the point of tonight, but um, I'm concerned, as I've shared with the college presidents, concern of administrative costs of the consortium and the escalation of, of the third party increases um, that have gone from $299,000 for third party benefits up to $799,000 in, in four years. Um, and I see here in your presentation that our premiums don't support any of those administrative expenses or any consultant reports um, because of our, our rates and our rate validation. Um, I'm a little confused at that. So we're not contributing anything. This college is not contributing anything to the consortium for administrative costs or anything like that? You really aren't, Dr. Barrett, because your claim expense actually exceeded the premiums we had received from your college. So there was, uh, we didn't even have enough money to pay your claims. So, and that's where the other colleges, you know, get into subsidizing of those colleges where the claims exceed uh, that. The consortium uh, administrative expenses, uh, you know, if you look back over the last uh, five or six years, we've gone from six employees to 10 employees. Uh, we've increased our uh, self-insured uh, health plan enrollment 20%. And the property casualty um, is, is an enormous uh, uh, strain on those. At the same time, we can point and, and provide you detailed information where we've saved the colleges millions of dollars through our negotiations from that, that relatively small staff. The uh, electronic enrollment and compliance, uh, there is a detailed explanation in here. We'd be able to, glad to go through. That again is uh, uh, eight tenths of one percent of the administrative cost, uh, as the consortium is eight tenths of one percent. Um, and included in that eight tenths on the consortium uh, is such things as the wellness, uh, the teledoc program, uh, our audit and uh, you know consulting actuarial fees stuff like that but the electronic enrollment and compliance ensures uh, the compliance with the uh, state and federal mandates uh, so that has been a plus in many of the colleges I believe Justin is correct saying that, that that maybe has been somewhat of a savings to some of the colleges uh. yeah we did a uh, dependent eligibility verification at BMC helped us um, in that in order to uh, we had we had a lot of our members uh, of 19,000 uh, members enrolled. Uh, we had several that were aged out, but were still receiving receiving benefits. And so um, through that process, we were able to define those that uh, that uh, were not eligible and, and get them get them actually off, off the plan. But FBMC with with our enrollment are, is actually able to. Um, employees are able to upload um, documents so that we can truly verify, verify HR can truly verify that uh, dependents are eligible to be on the plan. And my last class, my only last question is: Is how much money did the um, consortium um, be in the profit state and not profit in um, surplus this year from the fiscal year? Uh, um, this year we're running uh, we're running pretty close on on overall uh, claim expense uh, through the first uh, eleven months where I have the actual claims uh, from last year. We're, we're running okay. yes sir okay. through two seventeen. Uh, we're running uh, very close uh, on years where uh, there is a, like the state requires a self insured plan to have uh, two months of claim expense. We have a little over three months. Um, uh, for the, at the consortium, and again, the uh, we have a fiscal agent that, that monitors all the finances as well as the operations committee, and of course the council of presidents. Um, but if there is surplus, then um, then uh, certainly it can be uh, to the benefit of the colleges in in how the uh, the various committees would would elect to do that and use those funds. I have one for you. Yes, sir. You cover our health. You cover our property and casualty. And I just don't know the answer to this. Do you cover any of our general or commercial liability, or is that someone else? Liability insurance? Yes, we, we, care, we cover the general liability, um, network um, liability, all, all the forms of insurance now, um, we, we do cover for the colleges. Has there been any rate validation done as far as the, from the liability aspect of what were cost-benefit ratios? Um, we have done um, several um, several audits, but I can't say that there's been a rate validation um, because property changes so much with, with the market because of, of storms or, or this or that. So uh, there's a little bit more turbulence and, oh, I shouldn't say that because the healthcare reform is crazy too. Um, but there there is a lot more moving parts um, when it come, comes to that because it's not just one form of insurance, it's, it's several different. But, but our rate, I assume, is based on experience, just like the health sure. would be, it's experience rating. Okay. 
I guess, um, you know, knowing the consortium, maybe this is piggybacking on your question, is that, so, you know, this is one piece of what we all participate in with the consortium. It might be nice to be able to see, you know, yes, we're, we're maybe taking it on the chin on this piece, but I'd like to be able to see on one of the other things we're doing that maybe we're on the pu the plus category. So, so just, just for, for, for instance, if, say, Hurricane Irma came, came in um, and there was a, the, uh, something happened with one of the buildings, uh, there's a there's a deductible three percent um, um, for for hurricane. But if say say you had um, I, I don't know something happened to this building just on a normal day. You had 18 inches of rain and and it flooded out. The college had and there was probably a million and a half two million dollars worth of, of damage done. The college has a ten thousand dollar deductible. Um, the consortium takes care of the rest of that. Um, Pensacola State College just a couple of years ago had had that same instance. They had 18 inches of rain in less than 24 hours. Had six point five million dollar claim, they paid ten thousand dollars. Okay. Right. I guess what I guess what Mr. Wood. Yeah, what Mr. <laughs> Fiegel is saying, if I'm reading into it right, is well, if we're not having too many claims there, well, should we reevaluate there and say <laughs> colleges that are out on the coast and colleges that are you know having all the damage, should we say, hey, let's you know, since it seems like everybody wants to be like, hey, we'll get a better deal. Uh, I mean, I'm not humoring you. I just Kind of sure. thinking out loud if, if it's what you're thinking. Yeah, small may be better. In that Which is in that situation, we may say, hey, we didn't have six and a half million dollars that you had to pay out. We've well, only paid out, you know, a million in the last ten years. Gosh, why don't you cut us some break? You know, cut us a break there. But I know the Florida Blue people are like, why are we listening to this? <laughs> Sorry. And we'd be glad to either come back or certainly um, get Dr. Barrett uh, additional details around the property and casually. I, I coverages. think that'd be great. At least make yeah, us feel a little better. I would call better. that a relationship review. So yeah. Speak, yeah. Sure. All the moving yeah. parts. But I do have another question on the health plan because in looking at page 16 I just want to make sure I understand when I look at the premium and claim history that is for Florida Gateway College right you're on page 16 right correct okay so I guess I, I what really concerns me about the three years is that the year is really impacting us and really causing all of this consternation is 2014 and we just finished 2017 and so you can mm -hmm. see we're trending in the positive direction and so when do we do we why do we have to wait three more years to get reevaluated when our trends are better or less if you did a two-year look back we probably wouldn't even be having this conversation right well and you said the average was what 94 percent when you were signing earlier 90 ish 90 yeah so we're not too far off in the last two years, but I mean, we still certainly have to make up. Yeah, I mean, you're certainly, it's an excellent point. I mean, you're trending in the correct direction. Um, when do we get a chance to sit back down and say, hey, we've really made progress and our, our composition, our demographics have changed to the, ba you know, mm -hmm. to the healthier side. And, you know, we're at 95.2 as opposed to 115 plus. So, you know, as far as the impact of losing money on us, it looks like we've turned that ship now. You actually make a little bit of profit on us. So I think one of the things, and this is a direction from our operations, they are board of directors. One of the things that the reason why we went with the three years to stop a, kind of a roller coaster. So say we did, say we looked at it and next year and did it two year. But then 2018 was terrible for you, and we looked at it again, and then all of a sudden we're going back up again, and we're continuing going up and down. So I think with a three year, they were trying to smooth out the roller coaster a little bit. Um, I believe it's the direction. So I guess we just should have hoped you waited one more year. <laughs> what 13 was? Was it 14 just that one little blip? Well, that's why I want to see the three, three, yeah. three to know. That's good. Kind of, but okay, thank you very much. Thank I really appreciate you, you guys. I Any more questions on this? Uh, Dr. Randolph, I think you had a question. I just have one brief question. Um, is you mentioned the different plans? Is Blue Cross Blue Shield the only agent that we're that the option is from? Yeah, Florida okay. is our plan administrator, so they they had all our portfolio plans comes from Florida Blue. And, and have they always been the only plan administrator for since the consortium? Um, well, the consortium enrolled with Florida Blue in 1986, and they have been the uh, the uh, plan administrator since that time. Um, one of the real pluses that we were able to work with Florida Blue on in 2010, uh, they reduced our administrative cost uh, for their services and uh, network access 33%. Uh, and they have guaranteed that unit rate from 2010 through 2020, which uh, anyone 
uh, familiar with the health insurance arena, that is absolutely unheard of um, to maintain that rate. So we, we've enjoyed that relationship. We are going to the market again uh, in 2020. Periodically, we do uh, take to the market all of our employee benefits. Uh, this year, we're doing the dental and the employee assistant program. Uh, we use a uh, outside actuarial consulting firm to uh, manage that process to ensure that we're getting the, the best value for the colleges using that purchasing power. I do have one last question. I know we all have questions. That's um, all right. This coming, is from, coming from a, a, a different state, I asked this question to Sharon, and she validated it through the agreement that we have with, with the consortium. However, many states and, and many colleges across the nation have gone to that um, if you have a spouse or have another significant other that um, has health insurance that in order to, for the college in order to save money and so forth that there be a, um, a scenario that um, our current cost for an employee is about seven thousand Sharon or something seventy one hundred dollars that um, that if there is a dependent or someone that has coverage that um, perhaps the college if the if that employee decides to bail out and the college pays say a thousand dollars to that person just as a way of doing it. That is a way, and I, I've seen that, but I, I think that impacts numbers, and I think it probably impacts the, the whole criteria, but I notice we cannot do that here, and I think that would, we've identified about 15 to 16 um, individuals of our employees out of our 208 that probably would immediately take that kind of, now I don't know how much money we'd give them and that, but that was a proposal <laughs> early on that we were thinking, and um, it's evident in the plan that we can't do that. So I don't know if that's something we can look at down the road or something that, um, that, that many, many places do that. Are you, are you referring to the 100% participation? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, and so to, to go past that, we do have what is called the DV plan, where those can be enrolled into a dental and vision plan. Um, and, uh, and so that gets us around the 100% participation rule. But they still, if they're going to get it, they're going to actually do it. That's what they're, that's what most of our employees are doing. They already did dental, um, so it's, it's just something. In addition to the health, so the DV is. So you're to incentivize them to, yeah. You know, it's just another way of looking at things. Okay. Interesting, because most places try to incent you to opt out of the yeah, plan if you can. Yes. <laughs> so no, that's, that's, right. that's what you're required so to be in it. We're required to be in it. That's right. Okay. So what if someone has Medicare? Um, then they, they can go. They can go on, on Medicare. Um, what, what we offer as well is a, a Florida Blue Blue Medicare plan, and then we encourage those that are um, 65 and older that qualify for Medicare to jump on it. It's, it's a cheaper rate. Um, the benefits benefits are great, but it gets gets that employee off of the self insured plan. And those so claims those ones are allowed to opt out. No, they're no, still, still they still have to. They still, still have a form. It's the consortium of their. On the Medicare, I'm blue. sorry, Florida Blue. Okay. They're, not, they're still counting they towards the cons out. consortium. Though. It, yeah, it just becomes they have to be retired in order for Medicare to be primary. Gotcha. Yeah, if they're still working, then your plan would be primary. Yeah. yeah. All right. Any more questions? Um, this has been very helpful. Appreciate everybody taking their time and coming Thank and you. talking to us and helping us understand it more for our employees and for our students. Um, and I'm sure that um, we're going to keep working on the wellness of our college and look forward to being one of the folks that get the, um, the money back <laughs> when you do the review uh, because our trends are really good, as you can yep. see. So, all right, thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate the dialogue and the good questions. Thank you. All right. Please save travels home to where you're going. And I, since we've gone so long, I'll be really, really quick. I just want to give a two-minute update. Um, as you could see, that we had the sheriff's um, officers, sheriff's liaison, the college liaison officer, outside tonight's meeting. Um, that kicked off about a week ago. Um, been very well received by students, faculty, and staff. Um, been also very re well received by the sheriffs. And we have two excellent officers that are on campus. They're walking um, people to their cars in the evening helping, being helpful in many ways. So I think it's a very positive um, effect already being felt on campus. So can't say enough to Sheriff Hunter. I see Trey's eyes going up. And um, the other thing I just want to let you know is that um, the legislative season is upon us again, as most of you know. Um, and uh, there'll be a couple of bills that we have to watch. Um, we'll be watching that. And it can't be better 
information that having Senator Bradley be the chair of appropriations in the Senate um, representing our area and he was very helpful with us in the Alusti project last year and we're hopeful that he our trend has been hearing that he wants to fund current projects that are being partially funded so hopefully that's a good sign for us and um, that's gonna I have a lot of other things but I just want to be brief so thank you very much and thank you for letting us have the consortium no, here I, um, I, I would like to you know that they've exited for a few minutes I'd like to just get any feedback from any of the trustees was this helpful to you um, you know I don't think it's changing anything but do we feel like we got the information to help support you know some of the tough decisions on the budget that we're gonna have to make going forward and let me just ask I, I, I think it was I'm sorry, I'm I'm sorry, sorry it was great guess. and given the information that uh, that will help us in making the decision even in the future and the questions that was asked for them to give back to our president and Sharon I think that's great that will help us to to better make decisions for our employees as, as well as for our budget well, give me, give me the big picture. When do we have a, a chance to? I mean, I was not finding any to listen to you, but when do we have a chance to make a decision? Well, I think, I mean, where, where you know, and I know we're being publicized, televised. I have some issues about the process, so that, that wasn't to be brought up from them today. Is that who oversights um, this this organization? And it, it, I'm not saying they're doing anything bad, but the thing is, is they're employees of the college system. And they're employees that I employ, and we employ all of us. And I just get nervous about processing of how they do processing, and we should be able to say we would like it done differently. And that's where I would like to just done earlier and do some, um, as Miguel was saying, just give us some potential. We were looking at the rest of the campuses got 4.4 percent, and that's what we expected. Um, we didn't expect a 13 point percent increase so it's I mean and I understand it came on a, a budget reduction the budget the increase of in our insurance was higher than a greater than the cut that we received from the state so it occurred afterwards at least we knew what was going on so those are the kinds of things I'm pushing for and trying to have some more accountability that when you raise your administrative budgets by I mean this whole third party thing has gone up 151 percent in four years I mean, so as we look at our budgets, I have to ask that question, and I'm sometimes looked at, well, why are you questioning them? Because we haven't gotten an increase here, so we're trying to. So and those 150 percent was actually huge amount of dollars. Because right. I, again, I kind of go back to the percentage of a one dollar. If it was a one dollar budget, 150 percent, you know, so so it's a lot of money, real hard dollars. And, and, and the so question I like, was trying to, and they were very cordial, and I think we were great with them. But um, my understanding is, is there's significant amounts of money in reserves, and we all have reserves. We have a lot of reserves. But the thing is, is that could have we avoided that issue? Why that third? Why it occurred this year? I continue to ask that question, and I don't think we received a great answer. Who makes the decision as to how you use those reserves? The council of presidents. Council of presidents. Well, do they have some statutory requirements though, since they're self-insured? On, on liquidity I'm sure they do I think so but right. I think they do but I mean I still don't have a lot of I don't have a lot of answers to those questions I ask a lot of those questions well, what, are, what are these other five colleges doing between is the 23 is in this thing there's 28 what, what? they've gone through their own um, and major major and this is where uh, as we fully transparent big, there's big, the bigger schools Broward yeah, Miami Dade um, uh, uh, Hillsborough and and Valencia have all chosen to go out of the consortium stay in the property they've stayed in the property um, business because you have to but they've found alternative plans that are less expensive and better plans um, for their thing um, what we're trying to attempt to do some college presidents are trying to see if we have alternative methods to try to shop this is um, so we may not have to use the consortium and make consortium may be the best Alter, best thing for us. So the challenge is, is that when we have an employee that we're going to pay thirty. This is where it comes down to, and we have an employee, and let's say forty thousand dollars, and they want to go work for University of Florida, and we can't change this, but this is reality. They're going to pay about a hundred dollars a month for their dependent health care. That same employee here is going to pay twelve hundred 
to 1300 mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that's where we have to try to retain and and that's where I got to try to make it so we can attract because we're never going to be that competitive but and so that's why we're trying to so hold their feet so now let me ask a couple of questions if you don't mind like I know AvMed is pulled out but that's an AvMed specific issue in terms of I think AvMed, AvMed specifically cited market instability in our county saying we're going to be in parts of Florida but we will not be in Columbia yeah, County they lost so a big state contract I think or right and so when I saw that happen enough. I was like your email is telling me that there's stability and I'm like there is no stability nobody knows what's gonna happen next so then you got Aetna's being bought by CVS and so Aetna is some you know around, I think Aetna got the state employees didn't they? yeah okay and so um, and so then you, you so you kind of narrow down in our area what insurance is really available what providers take you really kind of get you know you basically it, it's private blue, it's blue it's, it's blue, blue cross blue shield private which is kind of what dr randolph was saying which is hey if you're an you have a monopoly on this they do and when somebody yep. can offer them 33 percent and some big rate there's something else going on here that they can offer that i mean we probably don't know all the fine print here but no no big company like that it's going to offer that kind of deal without some strings attached. Yeah, I mean, I mean, and well, I'm not knowing. I, mean, so I think I think the string they elucidated was, hey, we're in this for ten years, ten no matter year, what. Ten year come rain annuity. or shine again. Well, they've been in it. They've been. That's they've been, been in it now seven, since they started. Since and eighty, so whatever. Yeah. Somebody needs to question what what about these other insurance companies? Right. Right. That's the thing. The opt out. I mean, my company will pay you to opt out if you. And that's what I wanted. I want. That's what I was trying. Yeah. That made no sense so, to me. That so I was trying to now opt. maybe I'm maybe I'm jumping the gun on something. But UF was um, like the Gator Care. I mean, is mm -hmm. there any way to? Because most everybody in our marketplace is being probably served by someone that's Shands or UF facilitated. It, it's difficult because you know having experience with gator care having had it having taken it taken it having patients with it, um, it it's they incentivize because uf and shans is able to say hey we know that you're healthy x amount and so we're going to give you this rate i don't know that that would extrapolate the same for our yeah, demographics okay. or our patient population or our employee population plus the providers are within their own network that right. they that they so own they exist to so, so it's a. I don't think it would translate over the yeah. same. I think it would be interesting well, to see, but it wouldn't. And putting myself in an employee's shoes, I mean, one of the things that to me, Blue Cross Blue Shield is very valuable because right. everybody that I go to takes Blue Cross Blue Shield, and I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to change doctors. So there's a benefit in that, and like they have this, they sort of have the claim on all the rural communities. They do. Yeah. Right. I I would agree with that as well. That you know, if you are looking for a subspecialist or now, within it, there are different plans. Some people may not take the HMOs. Some people well, may not take... that's kind of what I was asking. Right. Was like, where are we on our plan? Are we, keep, are we keeping up with what the marketplace is doing? So the last thing is, is so I've tried to attempt, and there was a bill by Representative Porter. It's now been um, pulled back, and there's been an addendum to a potential through the water management systems that they would like to become part of the state of Florida plan. So we are trying to work on trying to have language that we have the opportunity, um, colleges would have the opportunity to form their own consortium under the state, and the state of Florida would run the plan, but we would have to still do our own actuaries to see if the, the cost would be less. Um, it has been met with significant, significant um, resistance from the College of Presidents. Oh. And I don't, and I don't understand it because all it does is going to give us potentially another option. So I don't. I go back to Dr. Randolph's thing. I haven't figured out um, what's going on. I mean, because I just want to try to help our. I just want to help. At what point did the colleges go away from being state insurers? I mean, they never were. That never were. They never were. They've always been state employees, but they never been on state insurance. No, that was part of the statute. It specifically says in the statute they can't. Why? I don't know. Well, they're not really considered state employees. They're not state employees. Is that what you said, right. Chair? They're not. Well, we do get state retirement and all. You're not state. You know, I, I just appreciate the fact that you don't take everything for status quo. And I'm sure sometimes people are, you're not the most popular guy in the room, but that's okay because you're popular with us. I mean, these are the right questions to ask. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of going along to get along here. Now, I do believe being part of the larger group, I mean, 
I have to take their numbers for fact that they've that being part of a larger group it has probably kept the cost down, even though we're experiencing the higher cost. I just turned to that page 16 and I'm like, holy geez, if they just picked, you know, a different year, we probably would have been okay. Right. Yeah, that, that, I, just, I guarantee um, that 13 we were below 100%, right. 2013. I, I liked your year? question on that too, because that would have been, and then wait till now. And that wellness thing, that was fine and dandy. That guy went on a long time about it, and I'm all for people being healthier. But golly, I wanted to say, lower the gum premium and, and, and uh, uh, blood pressure might go down. Not Rocky, son. What, what, what sort of recourse do we have, which I think is what's yeah, frustrating about like this, is that how do we say, hey, set your timer. In three years, we want this re, you know, reevaluated. How do we make sure that we're not holding the short stick again. <clears throat> and well, well premiums, go up, premiums go up every right. year. Right. They're going to exactly. go up every year. Right. Right. We, we never got a good answer as to why the three-year was a 10-year, and we never got an answer. But, I mean, I understand, you know, they, they represent more than one group, but nobody, when you get into a group of, you know, college presidents, and they all say, well, 20 of us, it doesn't affect in a bad way. Four of us, hey, it helps us out, and six of us, who are smaller, well, the majority is going to vote. No, nah, keep it how it is. You know, don't change it because it didn't affect them. But it's like the not in my backyard sort of principle where if it's not happening to me, it's not really a problem. Oh, put a landfill. We need it. But don't put it in my backyard. Well, oh, I don't want to pay extra money. Well, same principle here. So I wish we could have honored the employees after this where they could have heard it because they'd have went out. Well, they've heard it. They've well, heard they'd have heard it firstly. They, they already really know. They already know. And our employees are very good about participating in we do have one, and, and it got too expensive for Blue Cross Blue Shield, I guess. Because we used to get fifteen thousand dollars from them. And now we're talking five. She has offered some up, so let's make sure we're. So the last thing is what we do with our employees, and this is what we do because it's the right thing to do. And Sharon's done a great job, and HR has done it. When we come for when we did the benefits in November, when the open enrollment, we actually encouraged our families to go on the ACA and not take our plan. That's what we did. And so um, that's what we had to do to help them. So thank you for doing that. I mean. Oh, wow. Okay, all right, well. 